All right, peanut gallery can quiet down there. Oh, uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you that are, well, for those of you that are here, as well as those that are on Facebook Live, uh, Colt and Brittany, Brittany is due in about three weeks, and uh, they are presently waiting on the doctor to find out if her water broke, so uh, be in prayer for them. Um, and the last I heard from the Mormons, uh, other than changing out spark plugs and uh, Colt, uh, I mean, um, what's the little coils, coils, um, and all that kind of stuff, they hit the road, and I think they're in Arizona now. So I think, uh, apparently the Lord worked those details out. And yeah, they, they uh, went down to Texas, and they were planning on getting out to Arizona, and uh, taking about three weeks with their camper and everything. Good for them. Um, they just spent a little bit more time in Texas than they expected to because <laughs> all of a sudden they were misfiring when the truck was under load. So uh, last I heard, they had done the corrections and they were still yet to put it under load, but haven't heard anything since, so I assume everything is uh, going well for them. Uh, so pray for Colt and Brittany and uh, Mormons as they travel, but... Uh, let us uh, read Romans 5, 1 to 11, and then we'll pray. How's that sound? Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance, endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the appointed time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps some might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through him from wrath. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have now received this reconciliation through him. Let's pray. Father, as we come this evening, we once again thank you for that opportunity to look into your word. And we ask, Father, for your spirit's enlightenment. Open our hearts and our minds to the things that you have for us. And give us grace to uh, enjoy the peace that we have, the reason why we have that peace, and understand that as we go through trials, that is all part of your plan to conform us to the image of your dear Son. Thank you again for that. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, the believer's security. Um, one of the things, and, and I said this uh, several weeks ago, uh, one of the things when you come to the Bible there is no doubt, none whatsoever, as far as God's ability to not only save a person, save them completely, but keep them saved. Uh, when we look at uh, the variety of congregations, denominations, etc., that believe that the security of the believer is not a biblical doctrine, uh, they are not understanding uh, the completeness of Christ's work. Uh, they're usually a little bit more oriented towards the Arminian uh, side of the spectrum as far as something I have to do. Now, I'm not talking about how we feel. I'm talking about what God says biblically, theologically, salvation is secure. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. So as we uh, look at our passage here tonight, 
We see letter A, peace with God. He starts out with a therefore. Now, whenever there's a therefore, you know the question, right? Wherefore is the therefore, therefore? And basically, he is connecting chapters three and four. Now, what did three do for us? Three uh, let us know without a shadow of a doubt that left to ourselves, there is nothing we can do to merit favor with God. Chapter four explains how one is justified by faith, or if you will, how they merit favor with God. It's faith in the work that he has done, not in what they can do. So when we come to this chapter, since you have been justified by faith, in fact, my version says it pretty good here. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith. Okay? So since you've been justified by faith, that's what justified would mean. You've been declared righteous. Now, are you righteous? Positionally, Yes, you've been declared it. Practically, this is what sanctification is all about. Now we're going to make it real in your life. How long does it take? Lifetime. Uh, when were you saved, Shirley? When she was 20. So she has been saved longer than I have been alive. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> so she's actually been saved about two years longer than I've been alive as of Tuesday. Okay, so that tells you, now, is Shirlene perfect? We look at her and say, she's close. She knows the battles that go on in her heart and mind, and she says, no, okay? Uh, and that's the reality about all of us. Uh, a lot of people get hung up on the concept of lordship salvation. And I understand the people that push the lordship salvation, what they're trying to say, have no problem with it. What I do see is sanctification, that process whereby you are learning by experience very often that Christ is Lord, yes, in that area of your life and in that area of your life and in that area of your life. And if you have a hard head like some of the people I know, look in the mirror, um, then you may go through that a few times or a few more times. But you're learning that Christ is Lord, yes, of that area too. And so we become righteous in our practice the more we walk with him. Okay, so it's connected to chapters three and four. Paul established that believers have been justified by faith. He actually introduces the subject all the way back there in Romans 3.28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by, by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Verse 30, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. So he introduces the subject and then expands on it in chapter four. Number two there, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not indented properly, but uh, that's okay. Happens. Uh, Isaiah 32, 17, the work of righteousness will be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. John 16, these things I have spoken to you that in me, in Christ, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. I don't know about you, but if you watch any of the news, can, can you get just a little anxious about what's going to happen? You look at what is happening to uh, gas prices, and you look at your budget. Kind of like, you know, I was doing okay. Not great. Okay. Ooh, that's going to take a bite out of okay. It's easy to get anxious. In the world, you're going to have tribulation, right? He goes on to say, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You know, we need to remember when things get tough that God not only is in control, but he is with us and he's walking with us through that situation. He will take care of us. Maybe not the way we want him to, but he will take care of us. And so we, we, we have peace with him. Uh, Colossians 1.20, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on the earth or things in heaven, having made peace, how? Through the blood of his cross. Okay, so we have peace with God. Now, it says here we have, this is the present tense indicating that we already have it. This isn't a matter of 
I was recently talking to someone and, and something happened in their life. A, a trial came into their life and they go, you know, I'm trying to fight the thoughts of what did I do wrong that God's trying to get back at me, okay? And, and I, look, I have lived through those kinds of thinking and the reality is, is no, we have peace with God. There is therefore now no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. We already have peace, God is not our enemy. We're not his enemy if we're in Christ. So uh, th that's the, the whole point there. Present tense indicative. We already have it. We possess it at the moment. One believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we have? We have peace. This is not subjective peace. Subjective is where I'm feeling it, okay? But we have objective peace. We are no longer at war with God. God is not looking at us as an enemy. That's all been resolved. We're at peace. And uh, be notice before salvation, all are at enmity with God. Uh, verse 10, let me see here. Did I put that one out there? Well, I got 8-7. So verse 10 says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more having been reconciled will we be saved by his life? Romans 8-7 says, because the carnal mind, this is true of anyone that's not saved, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. You know, when we look at what's going on in the world and we see transgenderism, homosexuality, the LGBTQ, uh, let's let men go into the girls' bathrooms. We sit there and go, what on earth is wrong with these people? What's wrong with them is they are at enmity with God. I mean, God says, simple, there are two genders. The world says, no, they're on, there are 87. Kind of like, guys, they're enemies. They, they, they choose to be in as, as much as you can choose. They choose to be in that position. The only thing that changes that is when God intervenes and changes their heart. Then they might start seeing that, yeah, it's really kind of silly to think that there's like 87 genders when in your DNA, in every molecule of your body, you are either male or female. There is nothing else. This is science, not some scientist that's being paid by a political party to, see what I'm saying? Uh, so they're at, uh, at they're en enemies of God. We are not. And how? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When we come through him, we have peace with God. So that brings us to uh, verse 2a, standing in grace, through whom we also have access by faith. Um, <laughs> Paul says some things at times that I, the, the, the best picture I have, and I know I've shared it with you before. When we were in Brazil, we had a boxer. His name was Boxer. <laughs> it's really easy that way. Uh, but boxers, they, they've got the jowls, you know? And especially when they're eating, those jowls just get filled with their saliva. And then they shake their head real fast and saliva goes up against the wall here, up against the bed over there. And that's why you really want to keep them outside. Because if they've been outside resting in the dirt, that saliva collects the dirt, and then when it goes, you get a stain on your pants. It's, it's crazy. But when Paul says that God lavished this grace upon us, that's the idea I get. This lavishment from Boxer was his saliva, just all over the place, okay? And, you know, it requires cleaning regularly. But the reality is, is this grace that God has given to us in Christ Jesus, not only do we, are we at peace with him, but we have access by that faith. Jesus says in John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And of course, we've already read John 14, 6, Ephesians 2, 18. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. We both would be 
Jews and Gentiles that have believed. They're now part of the church. They bo- those two groups both have access by one spirit to the Father. And then Ephesians 3.12, in whom we have boldness. Now, if I were to look this word up, I'm pretty sure it's basically going to say confidence. We have confidence, boldness, and access with confidence through faith in him. We are running into the throne room of God as one of his children and saying, Daddy, Daddy. And he may sit there and say, just a minute, honey. Just a minute, sweetheart. Just a minute, bud, whatever the case is. But as soon as he can, he is there to hear everything we have, uh, to ask him, to say to him, and, and things like that, because we have access because of grace. Now, notice, through whom... Uh, we have through whom we have this access. That's referring to Jesus Christ. He says we have access. We have an introduction. We have admission. Like I say, like a kid running into the throne room, speaking to his uh, dad, who just happens to be king. Uh, where did this access come from? Well, think about it. When Jesus was on the cross, he uh, finally uh, says it is finished, and one of the uh, uh, scriptures tells us that the veil in the temple, that the, the curtain, if you will, between the holy place and the holy of holies was torn. Now, this thing was approximately six inches thick. That's about like that. Woven material. And it's 15 feet tall in the width of the door. And it's ripped from the top to the bottom. This is not being done with a pair of your mother's sewing shears. This is God doing it, indicating that we now have access. Hebrews 10, 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now, notice, we're not getting in there because I'm God's favorite. We're getting in there because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And and that's exactly what Romans is saying here, that we have peace with God uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith. The uh, by faith part, at salvation as well as afterwards. One of the things I'm seeing, and this morning I was in uh, um, Romans chapter 11, and uh, he talks about people uh, that are disobedient. God has mercy on us because of Israel's disobedience. And in so doing, ultimately, he's going to have mercy on them because he was doing what he was doing to accomplish that Gentiles might also be saved. But he's the one that committed everyone to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. I think it's like verse 32, verse 33. Whole point being there is if you look up the word disobedience, there are three words that describe as a definition. One is disbelief, one is disobedience, and the other one is unbelief. Disbelief, unbelief. Whole point being is when we come back here through faith at salvation and afterwards, I'm, I'm seeing where in our daily walk, when we fall on our face, when we give in to fleshly lusts or fleshly desires, can we say that at that moment we've been disobedient? Can we say at that moment we are not walking by faith because what has God said? We're more than overcomers through him. Well, I I couldn't over. Yes, you could. You didn't believe. That's why you were disobedient. Whole point being is this faith is not just at salvation, but we continue to walk by faith. The faith of salvation allows us access. The need for it daily requires the walk of faith. So uh, we need to be about the business of not only being in the word because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, but seeing how it applies in our daily living, putting it into practice by God's grace, and then Uh, looking to see, you know, is there something else in my life, Lord, that I'm just blind to that you want to work on? Because the reality is, is if you ask the question, can I tell you? He'll show you. And and there always is going to be. It's nothing to be down about. It's a matter of, hey, 
I, I have moved past some things, but Lord, keep on going because I really like walking with you. It's not so much, well, I failed again. I failed. No, no, no. You kind of grow past some of that and you start realizing, okay, failure. First attempt in learning. Fail, right? Okay, first attempt. Okay, second attempt. I'm not going to say sail because you think I'm talking about on the water. The reality is I failed again. Okay, still haven't learned it. Okay, Lord, let's keep on learning. And of course, we're going to see how that works out as we go on in this passage. Uh, Number three, into this grace in which we stand. Uh, We stand, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, uh, which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand. We have a book in the bookstore. It's called The Gospel Primer. And it's four chapters. And two of the chapters uh, are, one's a uh, passage from Scripture, and the other one is a a man has basically gone through that passage and put it in his own words, okay? So there's really two chapters to read and then one passage of Scripture. Uh, But he's basically saying, look, guys, each day we need to remember the gospel. We need to remember that we're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. Why? Because somewhere in the rush we might think, you know, I'm doing pretty good. And uh, you've forgotten. You're not being humble at that moment. You're not realizing your need for God. And that's basically uh, what Paul is saying here We into this grace in which we stand. Each day we're standing in the gospel, not just when we got saved. Uh, Hebrews 3, 6 says, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. Now, Hebrews says, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Paul says the same thing in the book of Colossians. Uh, Elsewhere, he says, if you haven't believed in vain. And the whole point is not whether or not you can lose something. It's whether or not you really have it. If you have it, you're going to stand in it. That's the point here uh, in this grace in which we stand. Um, Number two there. Oh, uh, the word to stand means to abide, appoint, bring, continue, covenant, establish, etc. Uh, number two under there, standing in grace equals being in a state of constant forgiveness. Now, I, I, I recognize that depending on where you are in your walk, you may feel as though, well, I, I seem to be in a constant state of failure, a constant state of sinning. Uh, what does 1 John 1, 9 say? If you get it right for about nine months, then you'll be forgiven. No, it says if we confess our sins. He is not only unfaithful and just to forgive us the sins that we're confessing, but you know, there's a lot of things that we probably do that do not measure up. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, uh, verse 7, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness sin. Okay. So the whole point is, is uh, we get to be in a state of constant forgiveness. Even when we fail, the best thing you can do is just confess it. It's already been taken care of. And that brings us to letter B. It is God's grace, not the believer's faith that has the power to save. It is God's grace, not the believer's faith. Okay, the believer's faith is the channel that he uses, but if it wasn't for his grace, you can believe all you want and you're still not going to make it. Okay, so that brings us to letter C, hope of glory, verse 2b through 4. Paul goes on to say, and we rejoice in the glory of God. (laughs) This is kind of like James saying, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. We rejoice uh, in the hope of the glory of God. Uh, we'll, we'll get to the James 2 in just a minute. Matthew 5, 11 and 12 says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 1 Peter 3, 1, uh, 3 14, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled. Uh, Look, we are rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. How does God get glorified? Very often through our response 
to persecution, through suffering and things like that. Notice the word hope here, faith in what God has said will happen in the future. So we're looking forward to that time when we will be glorified. In the meantime, he's working that glory in us through trials. Letter B, we exult or rejoice. It means to vaunt in a good or a bad sense, to make boast, to glory, to joy, to rejoice. Because salvation is a work of God and cannot be lost, we can look forward to what God has planned for us, glorification, Romans 8, 35 to 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. In other words, for God's sake, we go through all the things that we're going through every day. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Yeah, but that trial brought about a failure, a sin, Uh uh-huh, and God's already paid for it, So confess it, get back up on the horse, and understand there's still a ways to go. God is in the process of bringing glory uh, to you and to himself. Number two, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. This is where it's like James chapter one, verse two, uh, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Well, notice it says, knowing that troubles that Christians suffer not the world. Uh, the tribulations are things that we go through. Now, does the world go through trials? Do, do they get flat tires in their car? Do they have car accidents? Sure. And what happens to them in all of those things? Are they conformed to the image of Jesus Christ? Uh, sometimes they go to despair. Sometimes they go to anger. Sometimes they strike out in that anger. Uh, it, it's not doing in them what it can do in us as we walk by faith, okay? Uh, So those, those tribulations are troubles that we suffer. It's pressure that we're under. Uh, Now, again, even when we talk about the concept of persecution, uh, this past year, we see where if you didn't get a vaccine, uh, you're going to lose your job. Uh, That's a a form of persecution, if you will, right? Was it only Christians that didn't get vaccines? Of course not. But again, how did the world respond to that kind of stuff compared to when the world is trying to pressure us into its image? You must think like we do. You must do as we say you should do. How are we going to respond? That's uh, the idea. Here it says we're going to rejoice knowing uh, that a few things are happening. Notice 2 Corinthians 12, 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. I see Paul is a masochist. No, he goes on to say, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. If gas gets expensive, and I was doing okay before, but now okay is a whole lot less okay, I'm doing this for Christ's sake. No, I'm doing it because Joe Biden isn't. No, 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 no. Everything you do is to be done to the glory of God. So God is walking with you through that situation. Your response needs to be that which is gonna bring glory to him. So, okay, Lord, if it means we're not gonna have pizza this month, well, rice and beans it is. Thank you, Jesus because I have something. Or maybe you're not going to have rice and beans, but you're going to have ramen noodles. I understand. I've been there, okay? But you have something. And if you need more, we have a deacon's closet. Uh, (laughs) uh, And of course, James chapter one, verse two and three. But notice verse three says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Uh, In Paul's verse here, he says, we glory in tribulation knowing that, Top of the next page, tribulation produces perseverance. Patience, perseverance. What's the difference? Well, uh, either way, uh, this concept of going through the trial, producing 
the ability to stay under a little bit longer. That's basically what perseverance or patience is. It is much like weightlifting. When you, uh, most of us are old enough in here, uh, how many of your, your knees bother you? Okay, everyone has raised their hand except for Dave because he got two new ones. Same with Wayne. You know, they both got new knees, uh, so they have no problems at all. <laughs> Not true, right, guys? Um, my son got a, a Christmas gift where it's basically a metal frame, and uh, the top lifts up, and then it's got this little wire that catches these teeth. And it's basically knees over feet is what it's called, and so it's a little ramp like this. You put both feet on it, and I mean, they're relatively close together, and then you just do squats. And I've been doing those lately, and the first day I did them, it's kind of like, oh, man, you know. <laughs> and I've already been doing squats with weight on my shoulders, just flat-footed, and it's kind of like, oh. But the first day I did it, it's kind of like, oh, man, this angle is really sharp and all that kind of stuff. But then I walked upstairs. Hmm, my knees don't bother me so much. And then I started doing it five days a week. And walking upstairs didn't seem to be a problem hardly at all. It's amazing. My knees have gotten better. No, the muscles around the knees have been strengthened by repetition. So just like building of muscles, the more you go through trials, the more you strengthen the spiritual side of things so that you're able to endure a little bit longer under that trial. So the more you do, the more you can do. Now, it produces perseverance, but perseverance produces character. So uh, with this knee thing, the more I uh, do that five days a week, the more I'm going upstairs, it's not a problem at all. There's no aches and pains. There's no difficulties. And uh, all of a sudden, it's kind of like, I got to go upstairs. Okay. Where before, it's kind of like, oh, man, I got to go upstairs again. Kind of hang on to the railing and, oh, ah, e. Now it's, okay, not a problem. See, there's a whole different attitude because the muscles have been strengthened. Well, the same thing is true. The more you go through the trial, the more you learn about putting off and putting on. Now, when have you put on a new habit to replace an old? Not when the old is stopped. It's when you're doing the new more than the old. But that means you're still doing the old sometimes. Yeah, but now I'm doing the new more. So I have put on a new habit. We're still working on the remnants of the law of sin in my members, but things are changing. And not only uh, the habit but my attitude about the habit. When we first started, the temptation came and it's kind of like, oh no, I can't handle it, boom. And then the more I realize, oh, this is wrong and oh, I'm seeing the trigger here now. I'm, Lord, I really need some help here. I may still go kaboom, but I've gone a little bit longer. And then before you know it, kind of like, ah, I remember how this thing works. Lord, I thank you that this morning we had a good time together and I know you're going to get me through this thing. And all of a sudden, I didn't sin. I've won the victory. No, no, you've just been through another one of the battles. You're going to go through another one and another one and another one. And before you know it, you're, you're not even going to be triggered anymore. You're going to be walking as an overcomer and then occasionally you may struggle. But that, that's how things work and so now you produce character. So character, growth through these trials is seen by the one that's going through them. Now, I'll be honest with you. Other people may see that character a little bit before you do because very often we hold, we hold ourselves to this standard that sometimes is even unreasonable. God doesn't even hold you to that standard, you know? But the reality is, is you're going to see the change in attitude, the change in thinking, and the change in practice as we go along. But how do you get there? You're going through the trials. Uh, notice, through these, we gain assurance of salvation. The more you see where you're, you're trusting in the Lord, you're being empowered by the Spirit to say no, and to the point where, you know, that's not even a temptation anymore, when you're experiencing that, it's kind of like, wow, God has done a work in me. Now, he'll bring up something else that still needs to be worked on, but 
okay, he got me through that one. He can get me through this one too. See, now I'm, a fe- I'm feeling assurance of my salvation. Was my salvation ever in biblical or theological question? No, if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved whether or not you feel like it. Feeling comes through the practice of failure, learning to trust more, going through it again, finally getting it right. How long does that take? It's a lifetime of doing it over and over and over and over and over again in different areas. Just because you, you see the giant in the land and maybe you finally see that one conquered doesn't mean you've gained the whole land. It means, okay, you got the giant. And how long did it take to take care of the giants in the land? One day after they took care of all kinds of other things, Caleb says, give me that mountain. Goes up there, boom, one day, all the giants are done. But they were worried about the giants. We look at that one sin that we really struggle with and God's sitting there saying, hey, we got a whole batch we're gonna be working on because you're gonna be like Jesus, not just in that one area, in all of it. And it's gonna take time. We're gonna work on this one for a little while and you're gonna win. And we're gonna work on this one. We're gonna be working on this one over here and you don't even realize it's a problem yet. Okay. (laughs) So uh, character, hope. The more we walk with him, the more we see some of those victories come along, the more we recognize, like James 1 says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he will receive the crown of life. He's approved. When he's tried and has that victory, he's approved. He's gonna receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those that he loves, or that love him, I should say. And and the reality is, is so as I'm loving him, now everything I'm going through, I want to please him in, and all of a sudden, I'm not struggling like I used to. Why was I struggling before? Who did I love? I love me. And now I'm learning to love him, and there is reward for that. Letter D, possession of divine love, verses 5 to 8. Now, hope does not disappoint. The more we pursue holiness, the more we suffer, the more we recognize that we are one of God's. Uh, Very often when we think of suffering as Christians, we think of persecution. Interesting. Because in a couple of chapters, we're going to see Paul talk about the things I want to do. Those are the things I don't do. The things that I hate, the sins that were a part of my life before my salvation, I, I, I can't seem to get past those. And then he moves on to chapter 8, and after he gets past the, the difference between the unbeliever and the believer, he starts talking about suffering. In the context, the only suffering that's been mentioned is my own personal battle against my own sin. Not persecution. Persecution isn't mentioned until like verse 35 of Romans chapter 8. Suffering is mentioned in verse 13 of chapter 8. Verses 1 to 11 was the contrast between believers and unbelievers. So when you go back to 7 and get past the believer-unbeliever discussion, the believer is suffering just a few verses afterwards. What's the suffering? I want to do right. God's made me to want to do right, and I'm struggling with the law of sin in my members. That's suffering. So notice, coming back here, uh, the more we pursue holiness, the more we suffer. The more you want to live the way God wants you to live, the more you're going to see where, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have it yet. My life today compared to 20 years ago, I, I see victories in areas that, 20 years ago, I, there was no hope. I didn't think it was ever going to get past this. And I really enjoy walking with God now, but can I tell you, we're not done. There's still areas. And, and we're not even talking about areas that I was struggling with back then. God's bringing a whole new group of them. He, he's not redefining terms, but he's helping me see that those terms are so ingrained in me that even though they don't show themselves in this area, they still show themselves. We're still working on that. 
How, do, how did that happen? The more I want to be the way God wants me to be, the more I'm seeing where, yeah, in me, it's not there. I really need him in all of this. So hope does not disappoint. The more we pursue holiness, the more we suffer, the more we recognize that we are one of God's because do unbelievers suffer about their failures? Not when it comes to sin. Now, they may recognize they're doing things wrong, but what do they do? They just keep on running back to it, okay? Uh, And again, you may find a strange one here and there, but the reality is, is they're at enmity with God. They are carnally minded. They do the things that, are, uh, that carnally minded people do. And they don't appreciate the results that they get. But do they try anything different like Jesus? And the answer is no. Okay? So notice, because of the love of God. Uh, not love for God, though that may ultimately be the result of it. He's talking about the love, God's love. He says, God's love has been poured out in our hearts. In making us new, he gave us all that is necessary to live as he desires us to live. Uh, Ephesians uh, 4.24 says, uh, it's right here someplace. I'm sure it is. I don't have it here. Well, I know it. It says, it's on my sheet. Oh, that's why it's not over here. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, no, the, I was actually talking about the verse, though. Uh, it says, and put on the new man, which is created after God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, the reality is, is he's told saved people to put off the behavior of the old man. Why? Because the old man was already put off. You're not that guy anymore. So now let's get your behavior matching that. Stop doing the things that that guy was doing. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and start acting like who you are in Christ. Who are you in Christ? That new part of you has been created after God, not by God. Yes, it was created by God, but it's been created like God. After God in true righteousness and holiness. That part of you wants to do right. So learn how to walk by faith according to who you are in Christ. If you will, uh, he not only gives, gives us all that's necessary to live as he desires us to live, but he also gives us the power to do so. He says that the love, uh, God's love has been poured, in our, uh, poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.22, uh, who also has sealed us and given us the Holy Spirit in our hearts as a down payment as a guarantee. Galatians 4, 6, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee or the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is given to you as a down payment. It's a promise, I'm gonna pay the rest of it. Right now, you're in Christ, you have salvation, you've been redeemed, but you still live in a body that has the law of sin in it. Someday, I'm gonna redeem the body. I'm gonna take that law out, give you a new body, a glorified body, and you're never gonna sin again. Oh, That's the final redemption. Right now we have the uh, down payment. Philippians 1.20, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by death, life or by death. So that was the uh, understanding he had. Since I have the Holy Spirit, whatever I do, I want to do for the glory of God. Okay, so that brings us to number two. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Um, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. Now notice in number two, we were without strength. Here in verse eight, 
while we were still sinners. Both of these point to the fact that we had absolutely nothing to do with our salvation. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. 1 John 3.16, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, that we ought uh, to lay down our lives for the brethren. And 1 John 4, 9 and 10, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In, uh, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a satisfaction, propitiation, for our sins. So again, this all points to the fact that God is the one that did everything. And that's why theologically, biblically, the security of the believer is never something to be doubted. How you feel is usually going to be related to how you live. The more you walk with God, the more you're going to have assurance of your salvation. When we uh, struggle with sin, uh, there we might be saying, is it, do I really got it? Yeah, that's understandable. But if you got it, you got it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that from a theological or biblical position. Um, letter E, certainty of deliverance, much more than. Even more overwhelming than the previous points, numbers one through four or A through D, if you will, uh, having now been justified by his blood. If you have peace with God, if you have access through Christ, if you're saved, okay, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What wrath is that? Well, notice number one here, we are no longer children of wrath like Ephesians uh, 2, 3, among whom... Uh, also, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. Now, that first part there, when you're newly saved and you're struggling with old habits, you may read that verse and say, yeah, that's me. Now, wait a minute, is it? Or are you still living the old way and need to learn how to put off put on. And I would say that, yes, you may not be saved. You may still be a child of wrath if you're struggling with uh, the lust of the flesh and fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. But I also know that you may just not know what you need to know to get past some of that stuff. And let me say, when that stuff gets started in a person's life, it's not as though you flip a switch and therefore it's never a problem again. Uh, sometimes our preaching reflects that kind of thinking. And look, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are gone. What old things? You are no longer legally attached to that old man. You now are a new creature and you got a new boss. How much of that do you recognize when you first get saved? Depends on what they taught you, right? But the reality is, is let me see, discipleship where you're actually training people. You're in the word of God together. You're helping them see how this all gets lived out in a day-to-day. Oh, it might take a little while if all you're doing is coming to Sunday school, going to church. See what I'm saying? So just because you may be struggling with some of those things, I don't want you thinking automatically, I must not be saved. Maybe you need to examine yourself, see whether or not you are. But the reality is, is uh, struggle doesn't mean uh, one thing or another. Um, let me see here. I, I've got a bunch of verses that I didn't read to you. Uh, Romans 3.25, whom God set forth as a propitiation, satisfaction by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Uh, Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and to wait for, now these people had turned to God from idols to serve the living God 
and verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Oh, there's that phrase again. He delivers us from the wrath to come. Okay, uh, Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So we see in all of these, we were uh, reckoned, no, we are, uh, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. We're no longer children of wrath. And the wrath to come basically is condemnation due to sin. Okay? Now, when we think of wrath, God's wrath being poured out on the earth, we think about the tribulation. A lot of people like to use this verse to prove that we'll, we're going to be saved from the wrath to come, the wrath of the tribulation. Therefore, proof of the rapture. Yeah, I like the idea. But the reality is he's talking about the wrath that's coming upon people because of sin, because of rejection of Christ. Those people are going to be going to hell. We've been saved from that. It's not an issue in our lives anymore. Uh, notice uh, number two for when we were enemies, while we were enemies, when there was absolutely no reason why God should do anything but send us to hell, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Now, I don't know about you, but I really wish that some people would get their stuff straightened out so we could have a relationship. And God says, they ain't getting it straightened out. I'm going to do what's necessary so that we can have a relationship. That, that's the idea there, okay? And notice Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Concept of reconciliation made that relationship right. Okay? Uh, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, not holding it against them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So we really need to be letting people know God has done what is necessary to take care of sin. Your sin has been paid for, but you can't continue to live there, right? Therefore, when you confess who he is and, and trust in your heart what he's done, then you're going to be saved. But it's because God has done the work that is necessary. Ephesians 2.16, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, again, the both Jews and Gentiles. Colossians 1, 20 and 21. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. In all of these verses, you see it's God that's doing the work. It's God that's doing the work. We were enemies uh, it's God that brought about the reconciliation. So notice again, much more than, he brings that up again, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now that we are reconciled, he will keep us saved. Why? Because he is ever living. He has died, he has risen again, and that is never going to change. Since his death purchased our life, now that he's alive forever, so are we. Okay? And not only delivered us from sin and judgment, but also from uncertainty <clears throat> and doubt. Again, we're talking about a biblical theological understanding of what Christ has done in that saving work. He's done it all. We were enemies, uh, we were carnally minded, we were children of wrath. There wasn't anything we could do. He did it all. And when we come to Christ, we have peace. We have access. And that brings us to verse 11, joy 
in God. What's the chief end of man? It's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. I've reached that point in my life where I'm understanding a little bit more about the enjoying him. It's not waiting for the other shoe to drop because I blew it again. No, if I blow it now, it's kind of like, okay, Lord, I missed something there because I got on my little high horse, I got a little arrogant, got a little proud, thought I could do it, and I just, thank you for what Jesus Christ has done. Now, let's get our focus redone here where we're sanctifying the Lord God in our hearts. I'm not worried about, yeah, I blew it. I can't do anything about what I had already done, right? I can work on walking with him again. Uh, where it used to be, okay, give me a week, God, and I'll come back. <laughs> okay, number one, and not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we uh, have now received the reconciliation. And, and I think that concept of recognizing God's anger has been dealt with. There is therefore now no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. That's the only condition. So when I blow it, God's not sitting there saying, you crazy, stupid little fool, I'm really going to let you have it this time. But that's how we feel. Yeah, who cares about how you feel? You know, you know what feelings are all related to? Their passions, their lusts. And when those become the driving factor in your life, can I tell you, there's an awful lot of pride that goes on. Humility says, it doesn't matter how I feel. What does God say? I'm going to go with what God says. And then my feelings come around after I've been walking the path of God says, that's good enough. I'm going to believe what he says. So uh, the concept of being reconciled, I am in a right relationship with God. I still have the law of sin in my members. I still fail. God has taken care of that. So what, are, what is my responsibility to do? Confess it and get back to walking with him and enjoy my relationship with him instead of worrying about my relationship with him because he has already done all that is necessary so that I can have peace, access, power, knowledge of how he wants me to live. Don't know about you, but I really like this whole concept of God's the one that did it. It's all been taken care of. And as I trust him, I can be fully secure in my salvation. Questions or thoughts? Yes, sir. Exactly. If uh, our secure, if our salvation is not secure in Christ, then sin ultimately wins. Because until I leave this body, the law of sin is in my members. I mean, Paul ends chapter seven. So then, with my mind, I'm going to serve the law of God. As a new creature, I'm in his word, I'm studying it, and yeah, God's right. But with my flesh, I'm going to serve the law of sin. As long as I'm in this body, this battle is continuous. And if my relationship with God was dependent upon my failure, it's never going to be right. There is therefore now no condemnation. Not only that, there is a way to overcome the law of sin and death, but it's only by the power of the Spirit of God that he's put within you. So we learn how to walk in the Spirit. We overcome the law of sin, the flesh, the devil, the world. Hmm. It's fun. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we do thank you again for the work that you have done. And Lord, 
when we think about the work that you have done, we recognize that you sacrificed your own son. Your son sacrificed his own life for us. Thank you so much. We thank you that it didn't end there, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. And now through the power that raised him from the dead, that same power that you have put into us through your Holy Spirit, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us so. Give us grace to see the trials that come into our lives the way they are. Trials, opportunities to grow, opportunities to see how, how dark the sin of our hearts really is. And Father, that we might learn to glory in our tribulations, become the people that you've uh, saved us to be, and then, Lord, recognize the reconciliation that we have with you and be able to tell other people about it with joy. Thanksgiving. Father, we pray for Colt and Brittany tonight as uh, they're going through this time. Lord, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if she's going to give birth today, tomorrow, or the next day, or if it's going to be three weeks like it's supposed to be. But we know you're in control and in charge of all things. We just pray that you might comfort their hearts, give them grace as they go through this. And if that baby does come today or tomorrow, we ask, Lord, for uh, a good delivery and safety and health for both mom and baby for your honor and glory. Thank you again for your love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, you all have a good evening and uh, rest of the week. Come back Wednesday night and hear Pastor because he has words of gold covered with silver that he's going to share with you.